Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to another Clubs and Corks Golf Podcast uh, presented by Keenan Vineyards in lovely Napa Valley. Luke Taylor here, back in the flesh. Bernice is here yeah. and Ben Curtis. Do my wave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of an honor. We've yeah. got, uh, between the three of us, four major champions. <laughs> he has three. You have one. Yeah. Can you believe one of his majors? You only made $35,000. Yeah, it's crazy to think about, isn't it? Probably the greatest Ryder Cup player of all time for the United States. Very true. I'm curious how he'd do against Ian Poulter. <laughs> mm. We got Hal Irwin. Yeah. Sorry, not Hal. Hal Irwin. Hal, we had him last week. He's from Canada. I'm from Canada, man. (laughs) I apologize. (laughs) Hey. Hey, be nice, okay? We've had a lot of Canadians. We've had Mike Weir. We've had Bob Vokey. Yeah. We've had a couple Canadians. We cut out on them? No. Can you hear us? I can hear you. I'm I'm listening to such such nonsense. I'm trying to make sense of it. Uh, It's about right, though. It's about right. Um, so, uh, so what are you up to now? You know, you... I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, let's see, let me get, can I get back to you on that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, obviously I haven't played a lot this year. In fact, I've only played one event. Uh, I think it's, uh, I want to say it's retirement in progress, but, uh, I think anybody's played this game at a relatively steady level at a relatively, uh, high level of performance. Uh, once you take that half step back and you start playing maybe only 60% of what you used to, and then you start playing only 30%. <laughs> once you take that step back, you can just hear the entire field go right on by you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I have, I haven't stayed current with my game. Um, uh, I think when mother nature and father time get together, boy, they are conspiring beasts. <laughs> and it's it's sort of priorities, I guess, more than anything else is priorities at in my age. I'm 76 and what I want to do the rest of my life and with whom I want to share that time are really factors in why I'm not playing a lot. So but, what's your excuse, Ben? What's uh, bad golf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you, he just said it. When the people are going by you, it's, it's time to get out. And, uh, you know, I I. Much like you, I used to, I think you started much later than me. I started when I was two years old, and, you know, I hit 40 and I was like, that's, I don't want to be doing this anymore. But, uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, obviously you started, did you start much later or did you play real young? Uh, I, I was pretty much, uh, as a small, uh, let's say pre 16, pre college player, uh, I, I didn't do a lot. I was raised in a small town in southeast Kansas, and we had a nine-hole Muni Sand Green golf course. Uh, I just just played with my dad when he'd play, and kind of I liked it because it was uh, something I could do on my own. You didn't need you know another teammates or somebody to to do it with you. And I just kind of got intrigued with the game, but I, baseball was my sport for a long time. It was Mickey Mantle country in Southeast Kansas and Mickey was from commerce, Oklahoma, just right across the line. And then we moved to Boulder, Colorado when I was 14 and uh, continued with the baseball, but uh, I, gosh, I started playing on a Muni course. I'd caddy out there and I'd make $2 and 75 cents. I go pay my greens fees for $2 and 25 cents and, I'd have 50 cents left over to, you know, have a real meal. <laughs> That's awesome. But there was, there wasn't a practice area at any of these places. You had to kind of create your own or, or practice on the golf course. And I learned to play golf just by playing golf. And uh, anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, um, I played all the sports in high school and, you know, I, I guess I was a reasonable football player. I guess I wasn't so reasonable golfer and, I got a scholarship to go to the University of Colorado playing football. And uh, anyway, looking back, uh, I don't regret that decision because I think it helped me in discipline. I think it helped me in strength. It helped me in showing that even as a small player, relatively small player, I could make it and have success. And that really kind of bled itself into professional golf, if you wish. I, uh, I I didn't know how good I was. Uh, you know, I'd won some state tournaments in Colorado. But I really hadn't played against the best 
in the, the country uh, very often. Uh, but when I won the NCAA tournament my senior year of college, that was sort of the, the catalyst that got me thinking, hey, you know, I'm, maybe I can succeed. All these other guys that I'm playing against are going to turn pro. Uh, but you know, bear in mind, back in those days, if you, if you said you're going to be a professional, the rules of golf was intent that made your professional right on the spot. So you kind of had to whisper and kind of dodge around the subject. Um, so I, I went down to the, the tour qualifying school in uh, April of 1968 and played my first tournament in May of 68. So how am I doing? <laughs> no idea. I don't even know how I got started on this thing. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you played football Colorado. Was there ever a player on the tour when you were competing that you just wanted to tackle? <laughs> you thought about it well i saw ben running by one time and i, yeah. I thought well, you know maybe i could just blindside him uh, uh, no I, I <laughs> you've never, never been played. asked that before have you <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah that was a stumper uh well i mean you did put foot football on the golf course i, I didn't quite see it but you know peter james didn't take the guy down I, yes so. he did a naked guy too <laughs> Yeah, and well, I think his you know, midsection I, I, was around his, yeah, his face. That was an ugly yeah, yeah, that, I, it was I a good hit, though. Video and, and it I was a good Peter, hit. I said, Peter, I, I'm, I'm, our lockers are always close together, the <laughs> I's and the J's, so I just kind of moved mine on down like, a little ways. <laughs> so what do you think of where, where is Colorado going to end up in all this conference talk? Well, you know, I don't know. You know, they, they switched it's crazy. over to the Pac-12 uh, several years ago, and you know, what they're doing to these conferences and some of the old rivalries is just tearing them down. It seems like everything in our country is being torn apart right now. So I don't know where it's going. It's, it's everything's for the almighty dollar. And, and I can't blame schools for looking at it that way, but uh, it sure is difficult for those of us that have had allegiances to a certain school or to a certain conference for all these years and, and now seeing it go away. It's, it's kind of tough to take. Well, you must get really excited when Colorado is playing like Oregon, right? <laughs> so well, you know, go. not really <laughs> <laughs> well looking back on your football career who was the guy that you faced that you were just like wow this the, he's gonna take it to the next level and, and did you play against any greats uh you know when while you're at colorado i did yeah. uh unfortunately my sophomore your freshman couldn't play in them <laughs> our days so you really only had a three-year career, but uh, I had hurt my shoulder in Missouri the eighth game of the year, and so I didn't get to play uh, in the, the following two weeks. But that next week, uh, we played Kansas, and Gail Sayers was on that mm -hmm. team. And uh, unfortunately for Gail, he didn't have a, a real good line, a good team with him. Uh, and the coaches told our defensive team just – you know, fill the holes. Don't let him turn up field because once he turns up field, he's gone. <laughs> yeah. uh, but my opening uh, game against USC out the Coliseum, played against uh, Mike Garrett. You know, he went on yep. to have great fame with the uh, Chiefs right. and uh, Sayers certainly with the Bears. And uh, Walt Garrison, Oklahoma State, you know, went on to play with the Cowboys, had a, had a good career there. Uh, there were a number of those players that some of whom I've forgotten, but uh, I think the, the real eye-opener for me was when I was a senior – uh, on my defensive team between the juniors and the seniors, ultimately uh, six, and I'm, I'm struggling to come up with the seventh, but six of those 11 or perhaps seven of those 11 went on to play in the pros. Wow. So we wow. had a really good uh, defensive team, a lot of really good athletes. So those are the guys that I like to share my time with and, and learn from them because there were some of those guys that were really good. Yeah, you're much like my college uh, coach, Herb Page. He played at Kent State, and he played with Gary Pinkle and Nick Saban, and uh, Don James was his coach. So he, he mm -hmm. tells a lot of great stories. But uh, um, and they played uh, the University of Tampa down in uh, in the Citrus Bowl. Did you guys play in a bowl game while you were there? We did not. We were asked to play back in the day before bowls became as popular. We. Right. Uh, we're invited to play in the Sun Bowl, uh, but I don't think too many of us, nor the coaches, wanted to play in El Paso, Texas on Christmas Day for, <laughs> for, for a little money. Yeah. Uh, no. I, and when I became a senior, I was uh, one of the co-captains, and, and I'd escaped without any major injury, and I thought, 
if we play in a, in a bowl game uh, as much as I'd like to, uh, well, let me backtrack. We were leading Nebraska 19 to seven going into the fourth quarter. The winner of this game goes to the orange bowl. Oh. We ended up losing 21 to 19. Now that would have been a bowl that would have been worthy of going right. to. And hopefully we would have been uh, um, invited, but at the same time, I don't look back and say, I wish I'd have played one more game. Because <laughs> I, 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 I knew where I was going or I had El, a feeling El Paso, El Paso is beautiful I, on Christmas day. <laughs> you know, I, I, I yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever you say, uh, if you've Obviously, been there Luke's on Christmas never, day, I'll have no. to believe you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what were you saying about him running around? Remember, we were off well, there? that was, you know, that uh, we'll get into that a little bit here. Oh. So, so, t- uh, so tell us, so you, you, you graduate college, you go right to the tour, right? Basically, Basically right after Q yes. school, what Q school cost back then about $200 or <laughs> It's like well, five grand it, now or something crazy. I, I can't remember. It was uh, more money than I had. I know right. that. Uh, um, I don't know about today's player, but back then it was pretty unusual for a player not to have a sponsor or sponsors right. uh, that would lend them the money. And and I had two gentlemen out of Denver that were really uh, good to me. Uh, not good in the sense that I had to. Um, I had to pay them back. Let's put it that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't that it, good. It, no. <laughs> it took me nearly three years to get out of uh, that debt. But once wow. I did, it was, it was nice to uh, be on my own and do my own thing. So back then, was it, was it just one or two stages or was it three? Like it is. No, we, you know? we did. Uh, this was the first school they had in the spring down oh, okay. at PGA national. And, uh, we had uh, 72 holes. Um, was it 72? No, it was 144. We had 18 on Thursday, 18 on Friday, 36 on Saturday. <laughs> Sunday was off, 18 Monday, 18 Tuesday, and 36 on Wednesday. Wow. And whoever was left standing got their cards. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was the one time that I'm glad I played football because I had the endurance. But boy, other than that, it was it was it was tough sledding. You remember what you shot? <laughs> you have any clue? I remember. I think I was sixth or fifth or seventh in the qualifying, and it did not matter. Uh, yeah. No. That's all. That's all. It, so it how many, matter, who else came but, out with you? So who, who else was with well, how you? Many, well, how many also started and how many finished? That's yeah, what right. I want to know. <laughs> well, there were probably, I want to say around 100 entries, and they gave uh, 15 spots. Um, Jim Thorpe's brother okay. uh, was uh, leading, going to the last day. Um, he, he didn't, he, he met, got his card. But uh, Bob Dixon, who had won both the British Amateur and the U.S. Amateur, uh, Bob led, and I think he won in Cleveland, I believe it was, uh, his fifth or sixth tournament. Um, Mac McClendon was another guy. Uh, you know, you, you're making me go back way too many years. <laughs> you, could just make, we could, you could just make up names and be like, oh, yeah, he was really good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, – Ross Randall, man, these are all college guys against whom I competed in, in the spring. Uh, they were all good players, but you know, to say who made it and who didn't make it, I, I, I can't remember. Yeah, so he is. The I know greatest. that you didn't make it. What's that? I who, know me? that, uh, or I know that, uh, you, you guys are way too young for that. Well, I yeah. didn't try, that's why I didn't make it. I never tried. I actually had to go through, I had the six day or so it wasn't as bad as what you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah, out of California. It wasn't, huh? What they were trying to do. Uh, I know you know, that many holes in that short a period of time. Wow. You know, in this day and age, they wouldn't let that happen. 2021 wouldn't yeah. let it happen. That's inhumane. <laughs> well, it, it may be woke. I whatever woke. that means. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means, but I just said I don't it. either. <laughs> <laughs> so you're the greatest champions tour player of all time. You like dominated. I mean, you did very well in the PGA tour. Yeah, well, I think you know, we're I, skipping over. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about this. We'll talk about that. No, we're not talking about my majors. Why should we talk about his? Yeah. I don't have any. Yeah. So let's, okay, let's go to the majors. So you won three U.S. Opens. 
You couldn't win any other major. You couldn't like win two <laughs> U.S. Opens in a British or two U.S. Opens in like a PGA. You just had to just dominate the U.S. Opens. Well, you know, I, it was back when I was talking about my younger years and, and on the golf course. Uh, my, my rationale was that, okay, U.S. Open, I'm an amateur. And if you have a two handicap or better, you can enter and perhaps qualify. Now, the Masters. No chance. Uh, PGA wasn't a professional. And the British Open, what was that? Where I didn't know what that was. Uh, so really, the U.S. Open was the one tournament that, that I could point to. Say, I, I, I could qualify. I could play in that. And I, I did as a, a senior in, in college. I did make it the one year I played in 1966 at the Olympic Club where uh, – Arnie blew the big lead and uh, Billy Casper beat him. Um, the, I learned an awful lot about what professional golf was going to be like <laughs> at that golf course. Believe me. Uh, I, I remember making the cut right on the money and being the first out the next day. And the USGA uh, guy was there on the first tee and I was paired with Gene Boric uh, out of the Maryland area, Washington, D.C. area. And they said, we've got you on the clock right now. We have to feed off. You're the rabbits. You're going to, you're going to fly. And I've never played around the golf as fast as I have that day. <laughs> <laughs> I hardly, I hardly computed a yardage. It was just, okay, that's what it looks like. Grab the club, hit it and go. No, that's funny. Can you imagine how many that, players would struggle if they had to do that? Oh yeah. It would be. Oh, today be it's, oh, you can take a nap between shots now. Yeah. <laughs> Especially while they're talking to their caddy, right? I mean, it's like, oh, oh my God. Uh, it's either a seven sure. iron or an eight iron. Just pick one and let's go. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, I mean, I say obviously, but when I got to the ball, I don't know what you did, Ben, but when I got to the ball, I would just eyeball it and say, you know, yeah. it looks like a six, seven, or an eight iron. Yeah. And then computer yardage, whether you look at the bush over on the side, you look at the hanging branch on the tree, whether you look at the X on the ferry, I don't care what you look at, but you could quickly eliminate one of those clubs. Right. And now it came down to, okay, how long is it going to take me to decide between the seven and the eight? Yeah. It shouldn't take very long. It's very and, uh, instinctive, I think. Oh, but when I was growing, they didn't have you know, the yardage things. You didn't have books. Right. You didn't have these. You just you eyeballed it. And I got used to it. And I'd, when my caddy would get a yardage, I would have eyeballed it. And, you know, you, you get kind of used to it. And, and, and I hid. I, I wouldn't even ask him how far it is. I say it's it's about one fifty five. You know, it'd be close. It maybe one fifty seven. It maybe one. Yeah. So you really get used to it, and uh, that's the way I I pick the clubs. At least that's what I got comfortable doing. Unless the yardage was really different, I kind of went with my instinct. That's how I I grew up. My grandfather yeah. built a public golf course, and that's how I grew up playing. And we had a bush, and that was it. I knew that was the one fifty marker. Right. And no matter where I was, it was all, okay, where's that? And I kind of eyeballed it. And you're right, though. Like, I can go out on the course today. I play with my son quite a bit. And, you know, I don't even take the laser. I just I just look at it and I hit it. You know, I'm not even thinking much about it. And you're right. You'd be within as much as we played and you played. You get really accustomed to the yardage. But um, Well, you know, but, here at the Open Championship, can you imagine yeah. what the weather changes they have? Oof. But one uh, yards of 150 one day could be 250 the next. Yeah. <laughs> it's irrelevant. Yeah, it, could a lot be, of time. It, it could be 80 the next. So yeah, you really have to learn instinct. And and so it's 150. That's not necessarily a seven or eight or whatever it is. Right. It might go from a wedge to a three iron. Um, yeah. Case in point, the seventh hole of Pebble Beach. You know, you throw the ball on the green. <laughs> and I don't know about you, Ben, but the, yeah. the most I ever hit to that uh, was a five iron. And yeah, you stand a six on that team and you think, a five iron? Yeah. Really? But, you know, the old stories of the <clears throat> way back before I played, the old players, they just would take a putter and just mm. hit it so it goes <laughs> low, bounce it down there to get somewhere near the green mm. and make maybe a three, but get their four and get out of there because it, yeah. it was too hard. Yeah, last time I played Pebble, I had to hit a six iron, and the rain never hit the ground. It was blowing so hard, and it was 
the most it was like literally waste away waste, just chip it down there and hopefully it found the grass somewhere <laughs> that's but, right uh, uh, well I've, yeah, but, I've played you know maybe any number of places where the wind was such a factor but uh, the weather we used to have at pebble beach i know the first year i qualified at pebble beach that would have been in 69 i missed the 68 but 69 we're qualifying at pebble and i'm in a playoff for like fifth alternate we play the first hole, and it's been raining so hard and windy all day. And I get, I have about a, a one foot putt back down the hill on the first hole, but it's putting through a river of water. And I, <laughs> I'm thinking, how hard you hit it? It may float right over the top of the cup. I have no idea. Yeah. But, you know, backtrack just a minute that same day, playing the sixth hole, and there's this one single, the solitary figure up on the hill. And I'm thinking, what an idiot. That person is out watching a qualifier's play. So we play six, play seven, coming back up eight. That same idiot's right there. Well, the <laughs> idiot had this umbrella, but he turned and showed the profile. It was Bing Crosby. You can see the pipe in his mouth. Wow. <laughs> the idiot. <laughs> Bing Crosby's out there watching us in that lousy weather. And I thought that was pretty cool. That's that's really cool. Oh, my gosh. So looking back on your career, the three you know U.S. Opens, which one – I mean, obviously they all have a special place, but which one, you know, sticks out the most to you? Well, you know, Ben, it's the one that gets lost in the shuffle is the middle and the and Inverness. Uh, you know, we've yeah. talked a lot it's about Wingfoot, especially you know, the build up to Wingfoot a couple of years ago with Bryson winning. But Wingfoot was so hard. It's the hardest golf course I've ever played without weather being a right. problem. Uh, it, the rough was what we saw <laughs> this year at wing foot and the, you know, the gouging out of the rough, you, I don't care who you were. You couldn't gouge it out of the rough. Right. You just chopped it. You gouged it back to the fairway somewhere. Uh, that was the hardest golf course. And that being my third win as a pro, but my first major just made it all the more satisfying. Now, fast forward to 79 at Inverness, a, a totally different uh, era. I had my family with me. Um, just things that were so important at that time. I started with a really bad first round and fought back to uh, at one stage on the back nine. The last day I had a six shot lead. Uh, but again, I learned, I, I walked to the 71st hole. I had a five shot lead and I s patted myself on the back, said, you've won another one. And I immediately went double bogey bogey. <laughs> so, you, you learn from your mistakes. It's not don't over. Don't think ahead. Over. You don't yeah. think ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't but think then ahead. In 90, in 90, I was invited by the USGA. I, I didn't qualify uh, otherwise. And my I just wanted to go out and, and have a good showing to show that you know, I, I could play. Um, interestingly, I, when I turned 40, because Ben mentioned 40, uh, that you kind of think you might be wrapped up and washed <laughs> up and but I started my design company, my golf course design of 19, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 85. And I just went to Memorial, so I knew I could still play. But because I was taking a little bit away from that effort of playing and putting it over in the design part, I just became another participant. And I just kind of floundered that way. The design work was going great, but my play was not very good. <clears throat> so I sat down in the winter of 89, took out a yellow pad and I wrote down the tournaments I had won and what remarks, what thoughts I could remember about it. And that, that kind of got me thinking like a player again. And uh, once the 90 season started, I could kind of feel my game starting to come back. Yeah, I was hitting the shots, but I really wasn't into it. And right. I started getting into it. So once we got around to the open in June, I didn't expect to win. You never expect to win, but I was playing. Okay. And uh, so we go to the final day and Billy Ray Brown, who's one of the co-leaders, he was coming out of the putty green and I was going to the first tee and he, he's essentially asked any, any tips, you know, tip like I'd give anybody was, you know, play your game. Don't beat yourself. Uh, you're playing well, just, you know, keep it under control. And I'm walking to the tee thing. That's pretty good advice. Why don't you try that? Saying that to myself. <laughs> and that's what I did all day. And, uh, Got around the 10th hole, and Greg Norman, with whom I'm playing, he birdies number 10. 
And the lead at the time was eight under. I know Greg may have been at four or five then. And I'm thinking, you know, if he makes a couple more birdies, he might have a chance. And I looked at the scoreboard on the 11th tee, and <clears throat> I was one shot out of the top 15, which gets you into the next year. So I just said, forget about that. Play one under here in. And I made it two great shots at 11, braid 11. Okay. Top 10. I braided 12. Yeah, that's getting good. Top five. I braided 13. Now, well, now what? I braided 14. Wow. So I braided four in a row, and now I'm one shot back of the lead at the time. But they're an hour behind me. It's, it's, I'm right. still not expecting what happened. But that's why the big 45-foot putt at 18 got me in the house, in the lead, uh, with those guys that yet to finish. No, not to say that Billy Ray Brown or Mike Donald or Nick Faldo Donald. wouldn't play better. It's just that it's a different situation. Ben knows when you're playing back there yeah. versus playing up there, it's a little different environment. It is. So, I mean, the pressure, obviously, you're not – like you obviously know that if you keep making birdies and par, especially in the open – He's just going to climb out the leaderboard, but you never know what can happen. I mean, get that number, especially in that, you know, the U S open or the open, uh, those two, I think are the ones that the number can change quickly, right? A masters. I think you pretty much have an idea, you know, heading into Sunday, what the number or even Saturday, what the number is going to be right. up, but, uh, especially the open and the, but when you were running around high five and everybody, we noticed that you were high stepping. Was that to make sure that you didn't have like Mike Donald's, you know, parents or somebody <laughs> crowd stripping? Well, the rough is pretty deep over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, it was, uh, as I say, you, you don't expect a, a 45 foot putt to right. go in, particularly under those circumstances. And the, the, the enormity of that kind of an amphitheater, the sound right. uh, was just one of the more thrilling things that's ever happened in my career and that high-fiving was simply a, a thank you for you know just kind of a participatory <laughs> thank you um but it was a very exciting time now one might say well that was your best open and i say no because ben you said it there, it's different times different factors at play right. one i was a, a rookie almost at the right. again then i've been kind of an established player but still had to do something else and then Towards the tail end of the career, uh, they they were all just terrific at at, uh, at that moment. And then I went on from uh, there to win next week at Westchester. So, which is amazing because yeah, you played on Monday. Because <laughs> you yeah, played, played Monday, Monday, right? You played yeah. nineteen holes. <laughs> Here's what a U.S. Open champion gets for presentation, a celebratory dinner: cold pizza, cold pizza, <laughs> and, and soft drink. My daughter and my wife were with me, and we had to drive back. We were living in St. Louis at the time. We drove back with what was left of the volunteers' meal, which was pizza. That's what. That's why you get to celebrate. Was it so, good? Uh, yeah, I can't even remember. I, don't, I was so elated. I could have, I could have driven to California. You could gone. have, you could have ran and high stepped home. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, I, I preferred not to. <laughs> Ben, what was your favorite uh, open? What was open? Yeah, no, British uh, British Open. What was your favorite one? Well, I mean, obviously the one I won, but yeah. it, um, anytime you go back to St. Andrews, it's pretty special. Yeah. But, because they have the Champions Dinner. The U.S. Open, do they have a Champions Dinner throughout the week? They or? have had maybe a couple of them, Ben. I think that's one of the great failings that the USJ has not brought their um, champions together. I do have a photo over here at uh, Pebble Beach of the living champions that were there. Byron Nelson's in that photo. Uh, Arnie's in there. You know, some of the great players wow. are in there. Uh, awesome. And we have another one that was done at Marion, but it's done outside. And it, it looks it looks like somebody took it with a, a, a camera, a phone camera. <laughs> yeah. Just flip phone. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, the gallery's in the picture. It, it's, it just wasn't well done. But uh, the first one we had was Really terrific. Tommy Bolt was there. Uh, and some of these players like Tommy and like Byron and people that you might not know as well, just maybe what you've right. read and seen uh, film clips, they're, they're good guys. They're good people. And you can see the competitive instinct still in those guys and how they conduct themselves and 
how important it was in their career to have done what they did. And it was really, really nice. And, and I envy those players like the, the Masters, former Masters, and I envy the, uh, the former Open champions getting together. I think that's a fabulous time to, to share some fond memories. Yeah, it's a real. I have I haven't been back uh, since fifteen was the last dinner they had. So hopefully make it next summer. You're but, gonna uh, play. We're gonna we're gonna go and you're gonna play. I don't know about that, but so well, you, you played gonna, on. You got a caddy. I got I got Luke, 58, I got fifty eight different caddies. So. You know what? What I told him yesterday. <laughs> my buddy is a professional caddy now. He's got uh, he's on Brendan Wu's bag, who just got his tour car, and they're down in the Corn Ferry in Columbus yesterday. And I told him first thing. Dude, I was about to collapse. It was hot as shit. And if I got to carry someone's bag, mm, no, you can't pay me enough. Yeah, you I'll keep selling wine. Forty pounds. I don't have to lose forty pounds. <laughs> well, just like take 35. every other club. If you got a good pro, you can get <laughs> a little seven iron or big seven iron. Hey, I can know? be like Steve Williams and just not carrying yeah. a Tiger Woods, Woods balls. Just give him one ball. Yeah, one one ball. ball and a half set. You got it. Yeah, probably be fired within the day, but that's okay. That's all right. At least you made it a day. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back with uh, Mr. Irwin. Robert Keenan Winery, located in the historic Spring Mountain District of the Napa Valley, celebrate the best round you ever had or get over your sorrows after the snowman on number 18. Drown yourself in one of the 14,000 cases per year they produce. Combining the dedication of experienced winemakers with a commitment to excellence, the Robert Keenan Winery has distinguished itself as a maker of exceptional wines in limited varietals and quantity. Wines for sipping, wines for enjoying, wines for enhancing any occasion. In the last eight vintages, 42 wines have been rated between 90 and 97 points by Robert Parker Jr. As a special thank you, use code Clubs and Corks, all in uppercase, and receive 20% off your next order with Keenan Winery. They are golfers just like me and you. All right, so we're back. Okay, the question I wanted to ask you when we started. So you've never lost re representing the USA. Why the hell were you never the Ryder Cup captain? Five-time winner. You're just smiling. Uh, better ask the PGA on that one. Uh, <sighs> well, I don't know. I Surely I, I, I would love to have had that honor. I, I did not win a PGA championship back when I was playing. It was pretty much whoever won the PGA. Or it's won always PGA. that why. That's probably. Ah. They chose a, a PGA, but then they changed it with uh, – who was the first one? I can't remember who they ch they changed, but uh, – Well, Sean McKeel could be the uh, – a former guest, Sean McKeel could be the uh, Ryder Cup captain. He never played a Ryder Cup. Oh, so you have to play a Ryder Cup too. Yeah. So you got to win the PGA championship and, win, and participate in a Ryder Cup. Probably. Oh, I don't know if you have to have to participate. I think if you won it, uh, that may qualify you as a captain. See, but they they haven't done that over the last what five or ten years, uh, maybe more than that. They've they've gone to to whomever they want. And anyway, I, yeah. I don't lose a lot of sleep over it. It would have been grand. It is I what was, it is. Yep. It was, I was the first president's cup captain and that was great fun. Um, but I was also a player, which made it <laughs> even more fun. Uh, it was good about that though. And I, I, I don't want to get away from the point, but when you're a player and a captain, you know that you're going to have to split your time. And when you're playing, you need somebody that kind of looks after the laundry, if you wish. Right. And I had asked if I could have an assistant and, uh, David Graham was the international captain, and David said that's fine with him. Uh, the tour was good with that. And what I was really wanting to do is get Paul Azinger back in the game. If you remember, he was coming out mm -hmm. of his cancer. And I thought, you know, if, if Paul will accept this, he will be great for golf, period, because he's, he's, he's won a PGA championship. He's, he was a likable guy, uh, a really good player. And so I asked Paul if he'd be the assistant, and he accepted. And that's that's how this assistant captain stuff started. Wow. Uh, because you normally don't have a player as a captain, so you don't need right. that assistant. But now we've got we've yeah. got as many captains as we've got players on the team anymore. He, he started the trend. Did yeah. Tiger Woods ever call you for advice? The last Presidents Cup. <laughs> Who? 
T- Tiger Woods? Did he ever call <laughs> you? <laughs> I don't know as I know that name. Sorry. No. <laughs> no, he he, he didn't. <laughs> I mean, there's. I think Paul. Tiger's got a pretty handle on that. Yeah, it's Paul Pauling. Or, yeah, Paul he was in that photo. Paul I mean, you know, he's captain your captain of the Ryder Cup that I played on. Oh, yeah, there he's holding the obviously yeah. holding the trophy. Yeah, but he was he was awesome, and I'm sure he learned a lot from his experience with you guys. But uh, so I think the most impressive thing that you've ever done, the Payne Stewart Award, 2019. Oh boy, that was yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a real honor. I we all the new Payne uh, saw a guy in his early years that uh, kind of fit, fit his name um, a little bit of a roust about and could be at <laughs> times a real pain, but, but always, a, always a good guy. I think that was, he was a fun loving guy. And when he met Tracy who became his wife, she really, what a sweetheart, beautiful woman she is. And she put pain on the straight and narrow and, and he became a, a really uh, straightforward guy that uh, everybody loved. And uh, appropriately, this award honors everything that Payne tried to do in his the latter part of his career. And uh, I, I have to admit, I was taken back. I, I had given it one thought. Uh, but once you get immersed into that and you understand what's behind it all and you get the feeling of, especially when you're around Tracy and, and uh, her family, you know, what it means to them as well. Um, and I'll be going down next week, Atlanta, uh, to be, be part of that, um, uh, ceremony with, uh, Justin Rose yeah. and I look forward to it. it. It was such a fabulous time, uh, you know, presented by Southern companies. They do a great job. It's just a really neat affair all the way around. Nice. So I think, I don't know if you remember, but I actually play with your son, Steve, back at member of the little people's. <laughs> oh yeah and i i think i was i think we were about because what year how old is uh steve now well as, as a matter of fact ben i think he was playing in the little people's term in iowa the week i won at medina and steve you came is over. now 47 yeah because i think i was 15 he was 18 and somehow we got paired together and you came over and we're watching i don't know how long but maybe a couple holes or maybe all day i don't remember but I actually played with him <laughs> back then. So that's probably the first interaction we ever had. You know, he, he but, doesn't remember it, but he doesn't. I mean, yeah, sure, right. I was 15 years old. Yeah. He's not going to remember. Yeah. Who ben I Curtis was, from but, Ostrander, Ohio, Ostrander, Ohio, but, uh, <laughs> but obviously everybody knew, you know, Hale Irwin and Steve, and you know, he's a good player in his own right. And he played in the open and was it 2011? I think it was. Uh, Rory won at uh, congressional whenever that was. Yeah. 11. Was that pretty, was that pretty, very, I mean, that was probably very cool that you competed, obviously won three majors there. Was that probably the, probably one of the proudest moments having your son play in that event? Oh, absolutely. I, I wanted, I think you want for your children uh, to experience some of the uh, things in life that uh, have really thrilled your, yourself. And, and I felt like Steve's been involved with the game for so long, if not, not as a player, perhaps as a kid, but uh, being around it all the time. And, and I'm so delighted that he made it. Uh, he's played in two U.S. amateurs. He's, he's played in the Open. You know, he's been a, a relatively high-quality player in the state of Colorado for a long time. And I, I think anybody that doesn't have that experience never really understands what it's about. Ben's been there. He knows what we're talking about. You have to kind of go through life and take what you can, get what you can from it. But boy, if you have the chance to, to do something like that, then it, it really is a neat. But you talk about the proud moments <laughs> to me is when I, Steve and I won the father son tournament. That's one of the proudest moments in golf for me. Cause I was there with him and we played together. We were a team and I got to see him play his best golf under the duress. I don't care if you had a teammate or not. It's still <laughs> difficult. Cool. So last question, then we're going to go to our little Patreon section with a couple uh, quick questions. What's your out? I guess, what is your picks for the Ryder cup this year? Do you think the U S can take it back over? 
Well, I, I want to say yes so badly, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm i not sure. The, the, the course for playing Whistling Straits really fits more into the kind of golf that uh, the Europeans might be more accustomed to playing than the American players. You, know, you can say, well, wind, everybody plays in wind. Yeah, everybody plays, but there's virtually no trees at Whistling Strait. There could be some abominable weather that comes off of Lake Michigan. I've played a couple of tournaments there. In fact, the first time we played there, standing on the ninth tee, and here comes this old guy with kind of a pork pie hat on, and, and it was Pete Dye. And I, I said, Pete! <laughs> Get over here. <laughs> what are you thinking about on this golf course? What in the world are you doing? And he, he readily admitted that some of the holes just didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, like shipwreck. I, 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 if I had to bet, I would, I'd have to kind of tip my hat to the other team because I, I sometimes think our players are, aren't as strong. I mean, strong does not mean hitting the ball a long ways. Strong is doing it when you need to and getting the ball in the hole when you need to. Um, we have a, a great team, and there are some players that really could step up, and, and this could be a stepping stone or a launching pad to an even better career than what they've already had. But that other team, because you mentioned Ian Poulter earlier, the Ian Poulters of the world are what you want to have on Ryder Cup teams. Yeah. You don't necessarily need the, the glamour horse out there. You need those guys like Ian that says, hey, you want me? Come and get me. You know, they, they look forward to that challenge. And, and I, I just, I don't know our players well enough, I guess, to really cast a vote. Uh, so after all that nonsense, I'll just say, I don't know. <laughs> well, you, you just never know, do you? But I think, you know, Steve and, you know, Steve Stricker is obviously a great guy. He's great for the game. He'll do, I guess he'll put, he'll get the best out of them. But Padraig, you know, same thing on the other side. You know, he's a character. He's a lot of fun. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah. I hope we well, can. I got a it. feeling there. I got a feeling there. Locker rooms uh, have a little more uh, enthusiasm, if that's the proper word. And, a little and more beer. character. And beer. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall in their locker room versus ours. I, I do think that. Uh, Padraig is, is really a good guy. I, I really like Padraig, and I think he's going to bring a personality that that Steve is a great guy, don't get me wrong, but yeah. Padraig has got a little bit of the, the Irish. I mean, duh. Right. Uh, a little bit. He's got a lot. Just a, a, a gosh, he's duh. Really, really swell. Hell, really good film. Uh, but I do think that uh, he, being over here, always, I think, in, incites enthusiasm on their team. It's just like when we go over there, uh, you, there's a little different environment. Uh, you're playing in the, in the other's backyard, and they have more followers. So it just depends on how, if you take that as a challenge, if you, if you take that negatively. I, I always took that as a, hey, bring it on. You want to play? I, I load it up. I don't care what you do. What was your – who was your – who was the toughest opponent you ever went against in the Ryder Cup? Seve Ballesteros. Seve. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I didn't ever play Seve directly in the Ryder okay. Cup. Uh, I've played against him a lot of other times right. in individual, but I've been on teams where Seve was. I never played against Seve. You never tackled uh, him? <laughs> you know, I think uh, – because you can pick out individual matches that might not necessarily mean that that player was the toughest player for the week, right. but that day he was on or you were off, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but one of the guys that I've always felt that was really kind of an understated player was Ian Woosman. Oh, yeah. uh, Ian had that, uh, that he, here's a master's champion. Here's a guy who could really play, hit the ball a long ways. And you look at him, you might be underestimating what you're seeing. But there's a guy that had a heart as big as a horse. He, he really was competitive and loved to play. and He could mix it up with the best of them. Um, but he was one. Um, who else? I think anybody from Spain. Davis <laughs> from Spain. Yeah. You had uh, oh, Canizares. Oh, they, they, they learned to play 
different shots, uh, almost like Seve was, he had learned from somebody else, but the, how do you pitch with a five iron? Our guys don't know how to pitch with a five right. iron. <laughs> those guys know how to play a whole round of golf with a five iron. Right. Um, so those were the guys I think that really get down to the nitty gritty and the tough players. Well, cool. All right. Awesome. We're, we're going to stick with us for a second. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Uh, join our Patreon page, www.patreon.com backslash clubs and corks. And we're going to join uh, Mr. Irwin a little bit longer. He's going to join us a little bit longer. And thanks for listening to the Clubs and Corks Golf Podcast. Thanks. Thanks, AO. A lot of fun. All right. Thank All you. Right.